Hello and welcome to the midweek trading session right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Time to get a sense of how the markets are looking right here in Nigeria and um, globally. But first, let's get the top stories um, that set your agenda now, starting with some of the markets we track. We see gold prices are steady today after posting their biggest drop in a month in the previous session as sticky U.S. inflation raised concerns um, that the Federal Reserve might delay going for an interest rate cut um, that's um, beyond June. You see uh, spot gold uh, edged up there, 0.8% 0. Uh, 0. down, actually, $2,164. Um, and we see platinum, that's up, $937, up about 1.08%. And we see um, palladium, um, up 1.94%, about 2%, at $1,071. Um, per ounce. So that's how uh, the metals market is looking. Let's uh, get a sense of what's happening with the global oil market now. We see global oil prices uh, steadied in an early trading session um, today with expectations of strong global demand, including the world's top consumer, the United States, as um, even somewhat sticky U.S. inflation did not dent expectations. Uh, that the Fed might start um, cutting rates soon. See, all investors now are particular about what's going to happen with rates um, going forward. But for Brent, uh, we see May delivery up 36 cents, up by 0.44% at $82.28 a barrel, while the April U.S. Um, WTI crude, um, that contract rose about 38 cents, um, up 0.49%, trading at $77.94 a barrel. Well, the first uh, Africa Energy Technology Conference, that kicked off um, yesterday in Ghana. Let's find out what to expect and uh, happenings in the energy market. Joining us now is Chinan Dekwa, Vice Chair, Board of Directors at the African Energy Council. Great to have you on the show. Adi, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. So this is the first edition. Talk to me about um, this gathering and what it pretends for Africa's energy market. Uh, fantastic question. So uh, the African Energy Technology Conference has literally just kicked up here in, here in Accra to massive fanfare. Industry captains, uh, leaders of lots of verticals, ministers and heads of government, many of them here represented. And, you know, discussions have been largely around you know, the pan-African mindset, you know, given everything that's happening across the uh, oil markets today. What's the African position? How does Africa navigate lots of the turmoil that we're seeing? You just mentioned there around uh, interest rates are starting to become quite sticky. You know, much of the market was forecasting some sort of cuts, four or five cuts later this year. Uh, you know, given inflation is being sticky right now, you know, no one is quite unsure about that. So lots of that has dominated. There have been lots of discussions around interest rates and economics, but also, you know, sort of uh, production. Uh, demand growth in Africa, how can we localize some of the uh, supply chains here and there. So honestly, it's been a fantastic discussion, very robust, lots of, um, you know, clear areas covered. So it's been a great uh, day one, and right now day two is, is, is going on. All right, and I'm sure there's a lot of talk about um, money and investment um, at this time, but talk to me about um, opportunities that you see in Africa's energy sector. Great question, uh, uh, Ladi. There. So, and again, coming, picking, picking up on some of the discussions here. Huge amount of opportunity. A huge, huge amount of opportunity. One of those, you know, I'd say, if I start from oil and gas, um, the African mindset is that of monetizing and using what we have today. And lots of governments are saying that very effectively, but doing it in a much smarter way than we have done in the past. And the reason for that is because the energy transition is taking hold. Some of the barrels on the market, global, uh, you know, global demand is forecast to come down. I know OPEC has a different take to it, but if you look at lots of the forecasts that other people are putting out, it's forecast to go down. So Africa is thinking strategically around one, cost discipline. Okay, cost discipline. How do you increase cost efficiency within the production stack? How do you reduce cost of production to make sure that you're cost competitive so that if there is a haircut, if there's a production haircut up in the future, you make sure that you're not in that haircut, but you, you know, your barrels still hit the market. The other thing is, and that's another theme that's coming up quite strongly here, 
in this conference is the whole question around monetizing minerals for the energy transition. So Ghana's big on that, of course, Nigeria as well, with lithium, you know, lithium finds in the central part of Nigeria, lithium finds here in Ghana, cobalt and all of that. It's a thinking around how do we monetize it? What kind of policy framework is required? But how do we go into negotiation with these international companies to make sure that the value is domesticated here? So overall, very wholesome. And how's the African energy landscape shaping? I think, honestly, when I, when I say this, Africans are thinking a lot differently to what I've seen the last couple of years, a lot more cleverly about it. Yeah, cleverly, uh, clever thinking. That's uh, definitely good. But you did uh, talk about um, barrels hitting the market. And um, a country like Nigeria this time was still battling uh, with um, oil theft. You know, at this time, a uh, recent report shows that oil production actually dropped. What would you say is the way forward for a country like Nigeria, you know, trying to get the barrels out there, but also trying to secure, you know, what's coming out of the ground? Yeah, Ladi, it's a, it's a very complex one, I've got to say. So first thing to say is, I remember vividly being on this show when oil production was about 900,000 barrels per day. This is a few quarters ago. So today we are talking 1.5, 1.6 million barrels a day. So it's a massive uptake, and I think there's a huge amount of credit that we need to give to the government for doing that. But you're 100% right. There's still, I think, from estimates, about 200 to 300 uh, you know, 1,000 barrels per day of crude oil that's being stolen every day. Now, to, for context, that is higher. In fact, for context, that's probably the amount of oil production, higher than the oil production of Ghana. Ghana is about 170,000 barrels per day. It's almost double the production of Ghana that's just being stolen in Nigeria. Okay, so when you think about that, it gives you context. Uh, the government, I know, have been doing quite a lot in that sphere, but it's a whole industry of theft. You know, it's a thing that starts from the top to the bottom. And I say this with all sense of respect. Uh, we need to look at the whole architecture of the system, starting from production, you know, the oil companies that are involved in that, all the way to security apparatus. Because I can tell you this, Ladi, and you know this so well, for a vessel to moor into your international space, an oil vessel is not something that can um, that you can miss. You see, I mean, we're talking a massive, massive vessel that's probably the size of four, five-story buildings. It's not something that you can miss. So, for something to come into international space like this, then I can tell you this: that uh, you know, a huge amount of networks would have to all agree at the same time for that to happen. So, to your point, I think again, government is trying, but. Maybe we need to look at the whole to overhauling the entire system. I just saw a, a, a new DJ has been appointed for, for, appointed for Nemasa, for Nemasa, which I think is a positive step. Hopefully, he can bring a different kind of thinking there. But I think the Navy is another thing for us to think about. I think uh, NNPC and all of the companies that work in tandem, we have to sit everyone around the table or maybe overhaul the whole system. If we really want to deal with this, I can tell you this, we need to overhaul the system. You cannot, a country cannot survive. When you have oil theft on an industrial scale, the scale of, like I say, two times Ghana's production, it's just not feasible. Yeah, that's quite a, quite a big one. But let's um, look at the industry now. What are you seeing going forward in 2024, looking at oil prices um, at this time? Um, do you see any shock or, or tailwind on the horizon? And uh, what should Africa be doing right now, you know, as a continent for energy security and um, independence, you know, going forward? Great question. So I'd say this, I'll say two things. One is um, oil today is around $82, uh, $82 per barrel. Right. Okay, it's high enough, it's high enough. We have good clearance. If you look at some of our very high fields, you know, cost of production is around 48 maybe $50 per barrel. So we got, we got a healthy margin there. But I'll say this, there are a huge amount of tailwinds that are coming, and many people can see. Ladi, you kicked it up earlier, talking about interest rates. Many of us thought that interest rates would start to be cut from March of this year. It didn't happen in March. They pushed it down to lots of forecasts in May. With the reports yesterday and the CPI, where inflation started to become sticky, people are even forecasting there may not be any interest rates cut this year. Okay? And, you know, there is also talk, perhaps, of hiking again. Who knows? So that's one. If interest rates go up or if interest rates stay high, there's a threat there to the global growth that's been forecast. So we may not see the same amount of growth we're forecasting for India and China, which is what would drive this global demand. And therefore, crude oil price might fall. And then the question then goes for Nigeria that is wholly dependent on crude oil price. Can we actually make sense of a $60 per barrel or $50 per barrel? That's the question we need to think about. The second thing, Ladi, I'd say is, looking at the global economy today, there are talks of a global recession coming in. 
You know, it's not me saying it. Many people are forecasting a recession, perhaps in Q2 or Q3 of this year, just given the market dynamics. I'll give an example. Gold hit an all-time high last week. The stock market hit an all-time high last week, yes? So there's lots of liquidity in the system, and it does look like the economy is thriving. But if you look at the fundamentals of the economy, you'd realize that uh, it does look like we will be slipping into recession. Germany is in recession. Parts of Europe are already in recession. Yes, not the U.S., but it's looking that way. So if a recession hits again, that means global oil demand will drop, i.e. if global oil demand drops, supply stays that way, price will drop. And again, another risk to the oil price and you know to our budget, balancing our budget. So right. I would say we need to think very unconventionally around that. How can we reduce the cost of governance now? How can we reduce the cost of governance? I know ministries are being consolidated. You probably talk about uh, you know the issue that's dominating the market right now with you know the budget and all of that and you know having all of those. Yeah, the I think these are the discussions there. that people need to start having. Right, definitely. And uh, we, we've been dreading that R word since, I think, 2022 as uh, the big recession. Let's hope it doesn't, you know, come upon us uh, anytime soon. Thank you so much uh, for coming on Chinan um, Dekwal there. He's the vice chair, board of directors, African Energy Council. It's great having you. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, now let's check out some other stories now. See, the World Trade Organization says it's set to help uh, prevent illegal fishing on Nigerian waters as soon as um, the fisheries subsidies agreement comes into force. Uh, the Director General of the Intergovernmental Organization, um, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wella, made this known at the launch of the WTO Standard Trade Development Facility Project in Abuja. She also commended Nigeria for being the first country to ratify the fisheries subsidies agreement. To other stories now, see the federal government has spent about $560 million servicing the country's external debt in January this year, and that's according to the latest report from the central bank. An analysis of the CBN's weekly international payments showed that the amount spent in January was 339% higher when compared to $112 million um, spent on debt service in the same period last year. Uh, the CBN report further reveals in 2023, Nigeria spent about $3.8 billion to service external debt, and that amount uh, represents a significant increase from the $2.4 billion spent in 2021. All right, so let's um, look at another hot topic um, right now. As Chinan did say, um, there's a Senate plenary that held yesterday with allegations that um, ranking senators got about 500 million naira each for their constituency um, projects in the 2024 um, budget passed by the National Assembly. Let's get a sense of how budget padding impacts uh, the economy. Um, joining us now is Professor uh, Perry Kuna Ereha, Professor of Economics at Pan Atlantic University. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, good afternoon, Aladi. Can you hear me? Right, yeah, I can hear you clearly. So these are quite stark revelations here, but if true, how much of a problem is this to economic development for Nigeria? Okay, great. First, I, I want to say that. Uh, uh, now, it, the, the, the news about 500 million being released to a senior senator. So my first question on that is, is that amount a lump sum to them or it is an amount tied to projects? Because if it's a lump sum to them, uh, you and I know quite well that money supply has moved from about 53 trillion in January 2023 and currently it's eating around 93 trillion. That's more than 70% increase. So a lump sum release like that might have implication of money growth. And money growth is a major driver of inflationary pressure currently that we have in Nigeria. And so one of the major effects is inflationary pressure if it's not tied to productive uh, projects, except that it is tied to productive, productive projects. And the next question I want to ask is that, even if it's tied to project, is it who monitors the implementation of this project for the constituencies? Because one of the arguments is that these are constituency projects. So if it's going to be a constituency project, who monitors that? Who executes that? Who ensures that there is transparency in terms of delivery and implementation? If that is not going to take place and it will end up the same way like the unproductive spending that we have, then it will have implication on inflation. It will have an implication on balance of payment because fiscal, especially fiscal spending, has implication on balance of payment that will have implication on exchange with vis-a-vis -vis, so pass-through effect to inflation. And that is why today... Uh, the central bank is content with, you know, ensuring stability around inflation and exchange rate. And the fiscal side has serious implication on these two drivers of why the economy is in quagmire currently today. So my point is that 
The first effect is that if it's not tied to productive project as we have been having before, then it has implication on inflation, and inflation has implication on cost of production, which will make you know uh, regrowth to, to decline. Don't forget that 2024, uh, it has been projected that our economy will grow by about 3.2 or 3.3 percent. So with this kind of spending that is not tied to productive projects, then we don't expect that growth to be realized. And that is my first point on the effect that will come on this kind of uh, release of money. The uh, senators talk about the kind of projects that um, they spend on, and I, I know there's a lot of borehole sinking in there. Yeah, so 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 my point is this: uh, when when you budget, budget, you know, budget has two aspects. First is the current; the other one is capital. So the only one that drives economic growth and, and sustainable growth for for economic prosperity is basically on capital project. So the kind of projects that are being called, uh, I, I don't think they are purely, purely capital projects. I'm sure that they are some kind of palliative. You have seen where senators give out uh, some of these projects. You see, uh, you know, uh, tailoring equipment, or, or you see all kinds of things that don't look like, like really, really capital projects that should bring the cost of production down. It's more like palliative given to some from vulnerable in the constituencies. So my point is that if they are actually projects tied for productivity purpose, then that is a good thing for us. But if it is not, then I don't think that it would drive the kind of positive impact that we are expecting. So, uh, don't forget that currently now, we are, there are a lot of reforms that are going on from the central bank and even from the government. The government has taken a lot of both reforms. The point is that, that the public is seeking, you know, government fiscal discipline with regards to how we can support all of these reforms that are going on. And if this, this discipline is not ensured in terms of how money is released and spent, I, I don't think that the, the Renewed Hope agenda will be achieved. So, so, so the commitment of government to this agenda and supporting the other reforms with regards to transparency and credibility on the part of government for fiscal policy implementation is so, so important. And that is one aspect that government needs to look into without having serious effect on money growth that is currently in, you know, on the increase. And it's climbing so fast from about 53 million a trillion to currently about 93, 93 trillion. That is so huge. And so the way we spend our, uh, the way money is released, for instance, you just gave the, the figure uh, with regards to debt servicing, for instance. Debt servicing, so revenue in this budget, 2024 budget is probably about 42%. In actual terms, it will increase, especially at the point where HR has moved from about 800 in the absorption of the budget to about 1,600. It, that will increase cost of production, and therefore government project will be on the increase, and therefore the expenditure part of government will be on the increase, and that will increase the deficit vis-a-vis -vis debt servicing for the year. Okay, so how do you think, um, you know, a budget uh, padding, this menace, how do you think can be ended in Nigeria? And is it even possible? And, you know, we've seen rate hikes, you know, since uh, about 2022, you know, trying to tame inflation here. If budget padding is still there, will the rate hikes even have any impact? I, I think that this boils down to the part of the fiscal authority in terms of what we want to achieve. And that, that brings in the issue about transparency and participation on the part of the people. Uh, uh, there is what we call the International uh, Budget pa uh, Partnership uh, Index, right? What they do is to look at over... Hello, Prof. All right, I think uh, we have some uh, internet issues there trying to get uh, Prof to... Uh, make his point there. But definitely, this is uh, definitely a big issue at this time. And if we're trying to mop up excess liquidity, we can't be passing in more liquidity, you know, into the market. But let's try and get Prof back now. Um, Prof, yeah, you, you were frozen for, or for a bit there. Um, okay. You can continue with your thought. Okay, so, so I was saying that currently now, uh, transparency on the part of government is very, very, very critical. And, and that happens when we allow participation of the people. And like I, I was trying to say that, there's a global index that rate Nigeria very low, around 97 out of 100 countries, where South Africa is rated between one, two, and three. It means that our, when it comes to budget, you know, in our budget process and implementation of our site and all of that, Nigeria is, lowest, is, is ranked as, among the lowest. So one of the reasons why that is happening because in terms of oversight, in terms of participation on the part of the public and implementation and monitoring, we are very weak. 
And so one way to avoid that is to ensure you know, proper participation on the part of the public. And this, this also, not just the citizens, but also uh, CSOs in terms of their participation in the budget process. And until this is done, I don't think that transparency that is expected to engender the credibility for us to have the kind of fiscal policy that will take us to where we are looking at in terms of renewed hope agenda will be dashed. And, and so that is so critical currently now when you talk about budget process and implementation. Right, definitely still a developing story at this time point, but we'll keep uh, tracking it. Thank you so much uh, for giving us your perspective, Professor Perikuna Ereha, Professor you. of Economics at the Pan-Atlantic University. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we head straight to the markets. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. All right, let's um, get a sense of what's happening with uh, midweek trading right here in global markets and um, our local market. We have Anyete Edit with the details. Um, great to have you. Anyete, we're up again. Yes, uh, thank Anyete God today. it's Wednesday. Uh, thank God it's Wednesday. You normally say thank God it's Friday, but uh, midweek, uh, like you mentioned. Right. So, um, okay, so you were talking about the markets. Um, the Nigeria stock market is a sustained positive sentiment. You were the one on the stock market yeah. um, report last night. Seems to keep um, going up after dropping exactly. below 100,000. I, I thought it was downhill from there, but it mm. surprised me at this point. And if you look at your board there, it's about 103,000, another still going back uh, back above that uh, 100,000 uh, point, which we, which we uh, got back into and climbing higher. The likes of um, MTN Nigeria, the likes of uh, UBA, and then uh, uh, some other uh, 31 other gainers. It, it's, re it's, it's more like a repeat of the previous gainers list that you had on um, Tuesday, on Monday to be precise, because we, uh, we had more than, we had about uh, 33 or uh, 32 gainers and then about uh, six losers. So the market is still having a positive market breath and because the investors are really coming into the market to take advantage of, um, and I hear investors games. are waiting for some kind of FPI, you know, coming mm. into that market at some point mm. this year. But we'll see. And at the we'll same time, see. capital appreciation. So that's, right. that, that's, that's all what's uh, going to be driving the market. Now, so now, myself and Lady, we'll talk about the market. But uh, for you, the viewers, take a look at your board there. The regional indexes there, uh, it was mostly a mixed move at uh, intraday. But Nigeria's stock market still maintaining the positive uh, momentum uh, for uh, a, a second trading session within the week. It's midweek. So we'll be... Uh, uh, for at, at intraday, the market is still in positive terrain. Of course, it might sometimes tilt uh, to another side of, uh, of, of, the, of the equator, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's it for that Niger stock market. For the South Africa's uh, JSE index, it's uh, in the red by a tad 0.03% down at intraday. For the other sides of the market, uh, looking at um, uh, Kenya, as well as the, uh, the Egyptian stock exchange, it's also massive, almost 5% down at intraday. That's for the Egyptian, the EGX 30, Egyptian stock exchange, 31,039.78, but down by 4.97%. For Ken Kenya stock exchange, it was in the green as a Tuesday, 1.24% up. So that's it for the market. But we're still talking about Nigeria's uh, financial market, but this time on the fixed income side of the market. So we saw uh, more, more bullish sentiment for the, um, for the treasury bills uh, market, where we see, we see the average yield there had uh, contracted by about three basis points to 18.8%. But for the bonds market, it was a bearish tilt. Uh, initially it was mixed, but then it ended Tuesday um, rather bearish. And then uh, talking about the Naira, uh, of course we're talking about the fixed income as well as the uh, FX market. The Naira at um, the uh, Nigeria Autonomous Foreign Exchange market, it was up at um, 1,603 Naira 38 cover against the US dollar up by 0.9%. Now to give us more perspective, a deeper perspective on the Forex market, let's talk to Senator Aldu, Forex dealer at Access Bank for more details about the fixed income market at intraday. Thank you for joining us, uh, Senator. Hello, Senator. Uh, Senator, uh, please can you unmute your mic? Maybe you can't hear me. Yeah, um, thanks for having me, Anieti. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, yeah, uh, right now as we speak, um, I'm sure you're the trader there, both on fixed income as well as Forex. Now, can you give us details about uh, the second, if I'm correct, the uh, Treasury bills auction being carried out uh, by, the, uh, by, by the central bank or the, the debt management office? 
Yes, so as you rightly um, explained, the, the DMO, the Debt Management Office, is offering 161.49 um, billion naira across the three maturities, which are the 91 day, the 182 day, and the 364 day. Um, we expect um, rates across all three bills to, uh, to close around where they closed at the last auction. So there was an auction last week, the 91 day closed at 17.24%, the 182 day closed at 18% while the 364 day closed at 21.49%, up from 19% at the preceding auction. And we expect that these auction rates will remain um, largely at similar levels. Our, um, the, the reason we think um, this, uh, the reason that this is our expectation is uh, because the amount on offer is relatively smaller um, at this time, and, market is not, and the market is not um, at its most liquid. So the money market is just over um, 2 trillion in repo, uh, which, uh, which which means the, the market is in is in red or in negative. So we, we don't expect um, that much interest at the auction. So we expect risk to remain um, relatively um, stable. Um, that's for the treasury bills. For the bonds, um, the, the bond calendar was released today. Uh, we saw the DMO um, include one more bond um, from the um, from the bonds that were offered at the last auction. So at, so at the last auction, two bonds were offered, the 2031 and the 2034s. So in the calendar released today, we saw the inclusion of the 2027s. Um, at that auction today, all three bonds will have 150 billion offered um, each for a total of 450 billion across all three bonds. And that auction is expected to hold on Monday next week. Okay, so now that's for the fixed income side of the market, um, of the treasury bills and bonds. But let's talk more about forex. Overnight, we heard that the central bank, uh, the central bank has adjusted the customs duty once again. So, how is this affecting the naira uh, against the dollar as we speak? As, as rightly explained, the, the NFX rate closed yesterday at 1,603 Naira 38 Kobo. Um, with regards to the customs rates, we, we've seen that the CBN has tried to alleviate the, um, the tensions that may arise from uncertainty around the clearing rate by um, stating that the rate at which um, the, 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 rates, the rates that apply as at the date of the um, formation of the formem is the one that would apply at, at the point of clearing. So that has at least taken out the uncertainty in terms of custom rates. So with uh, regards to your questions asking um, about its effect on the FX market, um, there's no straight line to draw um, between those two things. Um, so the, the forces in the, in the official market are driven largely by the demand and supply. And we've seen that the demand has continued to outweigh the supply. If I ever seen the rates remain at, at moderate levels, at 1,603 um, Naira levels, we expect it to remain at these levels as the CBM continues to intervene, as, as, uh, as well as um, uh, the inflows we are seeing from foreign portfolio investors to take advantage of the high yields in the fixed income space. Okay, okay. so that takes me to my last question with you, uh, which has to do still with um, Nigeria's inflation. Uh, on Friday, the MBS, National Bureau of Statistics, will be releasing the, the inflation figure. And um, we have a um, financial derivatives company, forecasting 31.04%, up from 29.9%. Now, if this matches the uh, forecast by FDC, what are the expectations for the MPC at this upcoming meeting? Okay, so, um, as Riley said, the inflation figures last we received were uh, close at 29.9%, up from 28.92%. As uh, so of following the, that trajectory and the trend we've seen, over the past few months, we should see the inflation rate um, close at north of 30%. I mean, if that happens, it, it should be um, within the projections and expectations of market players, except we see the rates rise at um, levels much higher than projected. We expect business as usual on most fronts. And with regards to the reaction of the uh, MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, um, to any increases in inflation, we expect that um, the MPC will most likely... Um, and do what, what it has always done. The, the key mandate for that committee has been to tackle inflation, um, ensuring price stability, as well as ensuring that the exchange rate is, is at a competitive level. So we, we, we might see some adjustment across the parameters, uh, although we don't expect those adjustments to be as significant as what we saw at the, at the, at the um, earlier meeting. So at the earlier meeting, we had seen an adjustment in the NPR about 400 basis points upwards. We don't expect something that aggressive at this meeting. We may see some adjustment, but we don't expect something as, as strong. We also saw the, saw the MPC uh, move the CRR rate up to as high as 45% from 32.5%. And we saw a widening in the asymmetric corridor from um, plus 100 minus um, 300 basis points to plus 100 minus 700 basis points. Those were really aggressive 
have moves by the MPC at the time, but we don't expect um, such aggressive adjustments at the, at the coming MPC. Mm. Okay, uh, well, so thank you so much, Senator. I think we'll leave it there. And then, of course, watch out for our All the Markets Close midweek trading session for today. So that was uh, Senator Audu giving us details about the fixed income market as well as the Forex market as regards inflation numbers. So let's look at the Middle Eastern markets. Ladi, uh, for now, the market, the Middle Eastern markets, uh, it was uh, mostly they rebounded. Uh, the Tadawul wool is the leader there, if we can see on the board there, Saudi Arabia's um, the Tadawul. wool, that, that's what you call the index, it was um, in the green, and then of course that leading uh, the regional indexes for, for intraday trading session, Ladi. All right, I guess markets not looking so bad uh, right there in the global markets and right here uh, in Nigeria. Thank you so mm. much, Anita, for the Pleasure. details. All right, now let's um, head on to Europe now. See, aviation regulators have just completed an audit of the Boeing 737 plane after a door plug blew off uh, one of its aircraft mid-flight earlier this year. Uh, the findings are uh, one more setback for the crisis-saddled aircraft manufacturer. Well, joining us now is DW correspondent Emily Leshen in Berlin. Um, great to have, have you, Emily. So what does this audit reveal? Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Well, uh, in terms of the incident where a door plug blew off an Alaska Airlines flight, the audit is showing that four key bolts were missing when the plane left the Boeing production line. Now, there were a total of 89 audits done, and the report shows that Boeing failed 33 of them. The failures were related to quality control documentation and inspection, and the Federal Aviation Authority, which conducted the examination, didn't provide any specifics more than that. I also just want to point out that Boeing is under intense scrutiny right now because this is just the latest event in a string of incidents that really put into question the safety and reliability of Boeing aircraft. Your viewers might recall that in 2018, a Boeing plane flown by Line Air in Indonesia crashed, killing everyone on board. And then just a year later, another Boeing plane, this time flown by Ethiopia Airlines, crashed, also killing everyone on board just minutes after taking off in both of these instances. And so, you know, these crashes were later tied to the fact that pilots had not been trained on a new type of software that was being used in the plane. So it's a completely different issue than what happened on the Alaska Airlines flight. But time and time again, it seems that Boeing is in the news because something has gone wrong with one of its planes. And this starts to chip away at its reputation for being safe and dependable. Yeah, definitely quite a sad one that lives were lost. But how are investors responding to this latest setback? Well, it's probably not surprising to know that investors don't have much market confidence in Boeing right now. We saw Boeing stock drop, and then at the same time, we saw stock in its main competitor, Airbus, go up. And just a couple of weeks ago, before the release of, of the audit findings, the president of Emirates Airlines told the Financial Times that he was going to send Emirates engineers to Boeing to oversee production of its jets. It's just put in an order for, for some of its 787 and 70, 777 jets. Um, and that's quite an assertion by an airline. It certainly doesn't instill much confidence in the aircraft manufacturer, but we'll just have to wait and see how this comment, the findings of the recent audit, and these incidents are going to impact its financials. Right, but how are the markets in Europe uh, looking today? New data is showing that the UK's economy has grown slightly this past quarter by 0.2%. That's following a shallow recession that had entered in the second half of last year. Industrial production in the EU is down, uh, but perhaps the biggest news coming out of the EU has been the annual loss posted by Adidas, which analysts say is still connected to the fallout of its relationship that it once had uh, with rapper Kanye West, uh, who, who now goes by Yee. Uh, and then turning towards Asia, investors are keeping their eye on the Bank of Japan, which is expected to raise interest rates for the first time in decades. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Emily Lashner, with the details from Europe there. Right, let's take on some stories now in Africa. We see the shilling has rallied 
um, that uh, rebounded to an eight-month high, extending gains that began mid last month, and a trend that has lifted the Nairobi Securities Exchange uh, to the best uh, bourse in Africa on dollar terms. Um, it can be recalled the Nairobi bourse was one of the laggards in 2023. We'll see if a big rally comes for that market in 2024. To our next conversation now, see international grain prices across board push the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, the, of the United Nations Cereal Price Index uh, for February. Push it down by 6.1 uh, points um, to 0.7% from its revised January level of 113 points. That's a drop of 10% um, from a year ago. Let's hear why. Um, Ted George, Chief Narrative Officer at Cleo's Advisory um, Limited, joins us now from the UK. Great to have you in the show. Thanks. Good to be back. So we're seeing green prices, uh, in particular, that's wheat and maize, are falling sharply um, over the past six months. Um, what are the factors driving down prices? Yes, it has been particularly sharp, the fall in wheat and maize. I mean, wheat prices have lost something like 60% of their value since March 22. And that was the peak when the world reacted to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the fear that all those supplies were cut off from the world market. But we've also seen maize prices there at three-year lows as well. And the key reason is a really good global crop. Something like a billion tons of grain is expected to be uh, um, uh, produced this season across the world. We've seen strong crops in the main producers, Australia, Brazil, USA, Russia, even Argentina. But of course, locally, if you look at Europe, um, it was a very bad crop indeed. Um, so good is the global uh, supplies at the moment. We've seen China recently cancelling some future contracts for grain. So I think really the big uh, crop is one thing, but I think also we've seen a lot of people adjusting in terms of uh, the amount of consumption, the cost of living crisis, and of course, the readjustment of global supply chains. That's a big factor. And how supply, the, how the global supply chain um, disruption playing into all of this? And are we out of the woods yet? You know, when it comes to um, supply chain disruptions. Well, well, not yet, but but certainly the readjustment of supply chains after Russia's Ukrainian, uh, invasion of Ukraine really had an impact because initially, because uh, such a lot of grain was cut off from the world market, all prices went up across the world as there was a fear there wouldn't be enough supplies. There was the UN broker deal, which enabled a certain amount of supplies to come out. But after that faltered, uh, the Ukrainians experimented with a route hugging the coastline and then going along the coastlines of uh, Romania and Bulgaria. And that's proved very effective indeed. In fact, in the last few months, they They've exported more than they did in the same period, even three years ago. So definitely global supply chains have adjusted, but there are issues out there. There are, There's the Houthis and the Red Sea crisis. So a lot of shipping can't use um, uh, um, the, the Suez Canal. And even in the Panama Canal, because of climate change, there's not enough water now to, to, for the locks to use very, very big ships. So there's still quite a few issues out there. We're not out of the woods yet, but certainly in the case of grain, for the time being, they really do seem to have fixed the issue. All right, talk to me about how um, El Nino, uh, climate change, um, what, what impact is that having on um, grain um, production, you know, at this time? Well, I mean, at the moment, it, it doesn't seem to have been too bad. I mean, El Nino does sometimes bring better weather for certain crops to certain parts of the world. But with the uncertainties of climate change, you never know. We've had strong weather <coughs> in the southern hemisphere. That's particularly where a lot of the grain is produced. And that's partly because of the El Nino weather pattern. But of course, the worst of it is still yet to come. And there have been some regions which have been devastatingly hit. So if you're looking at prices, currently traders have the most bearish position they've had in 20 years. If you're looking at wheat or soy futures as well. Um, and certainly it seems like there are enough supplies. But we're already seeing a response from farmers. A lot of them are starting to plant less for the next season. And so if you add in what potentially could happen as well as we swing back from El Nino even to a La Nina, we could be right back where we started uh, two years ago with super high prices by the end of next season. Right. Definitely. We'll keep tracking those prices. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, that was Ted George, uh, Chief Narrative um, advisor there at uh, Cleo's Advisory. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. All right, let's look at our stories now. We see Standard Chartered Bank in Kenya, units of the UK banking multinational. Uh, Standard Chartered announced a record dividend payout, totaling about 10.96 billion shillings. I'm writing on earnings growth in the year ended um, December. The total payout of um, 29 shillings per share is 32% higher than the aggressive um, 8.31 billion shillings paid out in the previous year by the Nairobi Securities Exchange um, listed firm. Um, Standard Charter Kenya announced the higher cash distribution after its net earnings in the year to December grew by 15% to 
to 13.8 billion shillings, right in higher interest and uh, non-funded income. All right, now let's um, head to other markets now. Uh, take a look at what's happening in the crypto market. From the screen there, we see it's green, uh, mostly green on the screen, and some parts are deep um, green at this point. Just some few pockets of red um, right there in the market. Then we see Bitcoin staying at the $73,363, up 1.61%. Uh, Ethereum holding on to that $4,000 um, per coin level, but not convincingly so yet. Just about $58 um, there up. Avax is only, also up, but we see Solana and XRP in the green giving up some gains in Tron. But BNB is looking really, really green. We know Binance has uh, a lot of issues right here in Nigeria and in some other markets at this time, but we see that's not impacting the token um, at this time. Let's look at the sentiment in the market um, right now. Still a very, very greedy market. Um, extreme greed at 81 points over 100. Just a few more points uh, before the 100 point mark is blown off, you know, at this time. Let's look at the top cryptocurrencies we track. We see Bitcoin there, 1.6% up. Cardano is also looking good, 76 cents. Getting back to that dollar level, 2.41% up. XRP sitting at 69 um, cents at this time. Well, talking about Binance, we still have um, that issue right now in Nigeria and as there's still reports um, that the federal government wants data on crypto traders in Nigeria uh, from the Binance platform. Let's get a sense of what to expect uh, for Nigeria's crypto community. Let's talk to Ray Youssef now, uh, CEO, no one's um, joining me via Zoom. Great to have you on the show, Youssef. Hey, how are you guys? Good Fant to be here. Fantastic. So um, we see the government here asking for um, data, you know, from Binance, you know, at this time on us customer data at this point. But I guess it shouldn't be hard for a crypto exchange um, to release customer data um, to a government. It's pretty standard practice for crypto exchanges to give governments not just the data they request for with official subpoenas, but in many cases, especially in every single American crypto exchange, a backdoor that gives them access where they don't even need to make the request for data any longer. So at this point, is it how can the government actually have access without it being given? Yes. Uh, American companies simply give it to the American government. The intelligence agencies will make the request, give us the back door. You can give them the back door, you continue to operate. And if you don't, you're faced with extreme pressure and may have to exit the market. That's just how business works in finance, in the West especially. And you're seeing this being exported to the global South, in particular Nigeria. If you look at Binance, Binance is under a U.S. Uh, compliance stewardship. They call it a monitor. This is someone that will stay at a company for years. They overrule the CEO. They can do anything they want. They have full access to the company. So, in effect, Binance is actually now an American company. All right. So, you know, at this point, then we should expect that they would release um, this data. 100%. They already have. <laughs> They, they already have. All right, so, um, I, so, so at this point, let's talk about privacy now for you know, some of these you know, customers. I'm sure they wouldn't want their name out there you know, and all of their data you know, out there, but how can we protect you know, customer data you know, with these kind of issues? It's extremely difficult. The only way to really protect your data is to use a completely decentralized platform. This doesn't really exist yet. People can trade peer to peer, but Binance and even my platform, no one's, is still currently centralized. I plan on completely decentralizing no one's on a peer to peer decentralized open source protocol called CivKit, as in Civilization Toolkit. That's not ready yet, but there's a plan to do that. So, what can I say? Never trust an American corporation or any company that has come under the control of the United States, like now Binance. That's the best advice I can give you. But Nigerians have adapted well to the situation. They, instead of just, you know, accepting the situation, they're learning all of these other ways to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, including just doing it in a completely decentralized manner on Telegram and whatever other solutions they can hack together. So peer-to-peer -peer continues unabated. Right. And, and talking about decentralized platforms at this time, you know, we're seeing a heavy crackdown on centralized platforms. 
Um, do you think at some point um, they might actually go for the decentralized platforms? And is it possible to disrupt their business? Absolutely. Uncle Sam is on the warpath and the man is cracking down everywhere in the world. Absolutely everywhere, especially in America. The UK has followed, all of Europe has followed, and the global south is going to mimic those moves as well. So they can get any centralized entity, but they have put people who work on decentralized projects like uh, BitTornado, they have put that guy in jail. And they're going to, going to continue to apply pressure across every vector. It's simply not going to stop. And that's why we work on peer-to-peer, -peer, really truly decentralized technologies, because it's easy for them to cut the head off of any organization, especially if they know who you are, and they do, but they cannot stop an army of mosquitoes. Peer-to-peer -peer diffuses the risk, and that's why you've seen this latest episode in Nigeria. It wasn't just crypto they were focused on. They specifically mentioned peer-to-peer. -peer. Right. So looking at what's going on right now, what are you seeing for, you know, the crypto ecosystem in Nigeria and in Africa, you know, by extension? Well, I think Nigeria is ground zero for crypto adoption. It leads the entire world. And the Nigerian people are quite special in that you put an obstacle in their way to slow them down and they just go 10 times faster and they find 10 times other ways to do something. And they just keep going and they continue to innovate. This is what Nigerians always do. When the crypto ban came in, our volumes rose. Now with this peer-to-peer -peer ban in, our volumes have risen again and Nigerians aren't just stopping with us. They're teaching themselves and finding new ways to do this in case we go down or anyone else goes down. That's why I tell the entire world, Nigeria is special. It is ground zero for crypto. It is ground zero for the peer-to-peer -peer revolution, which is a lot bigger than Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. It started with the internet. Then we got these mobile phones, all these disruptive startups. Finally, with peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, we can fix the money system on these marketplaces. We can actually complete the work and create a world where commerce and money can flow. And that's all the people of Nigeria and Africa want. They just want to be able to trade with themselves and their neighbors. There's nothing wrong with that, and it shouldn't be illegal. Right, and definitely we know central bankers are not fond, you know, of peer-to-peer -peer or the decentralized nature, you know, of cryptocurrency. But let's look at Bitcoin, you know, at this time. With, with the spot Bitcoin ETF, and um, there are indications that Bitcoin will get really scarce. You know, what are you seeing you know, for the future of Bitcoin at this time, talking about price action. Now, Bitcoin is going to continue to rise steadily over the next two years. It could hit 100K, it could hit 100K or 150K this year. There is a lot of pressure coming from the ETF. Um, it didn't happen as quickly as I thought it would. It's taking a little bit more time. But I, no matter what happens with the price, I encourage people not to get too excited about that. Paper right. Bitcoin is not what Bitcoin is about. Real Bitcoin is self-custody, Bitcoin, and peer-to-peer. -peer. This is the power of Bitcoin. If you just let Bitcoin be about paper ETFs, then it's just another pet rock, a stock that people can hold. And it has essentially removed its teeth. It, that makes Bitcoin impotent. We don't need another asset class for rich kids in America or Europe to play with. They have enough asset classes to play with. The promise of Bitcoin was as a means of exchange, a means of commerce, global, borderless, unstoppable commerce for the people that need it most. And that means the people of Africa, the global South, Latin America, India, et cetera, the people that cannot trade because their banking system is broken. Bitcoin is here, is here to help those people. So let's not get too excited about the price, guys. It's all about education, peer-to-peer, -peer, and self-custody. We focus on that. And we're going to get the revolution we've been promised, not just another pet stock to play with. Now, we hear some people say they're in it for the money. Some say they're in it for the tech, you know, at this time. But looking at the way, you know, Bitcoin is set up at this time, is it really ready for day-to-day -day transactions? Uh, definitely not. Bitcoin layer one is definitely not ready for transactions. About eight years ago, the community completely rejected that and they bought all into the store of value narrative, uh, which makes no sense. It's an extreme disappointment to the Bitcoin community. And it came from the Western Bitcoin community. They did not ask the people of the global south to factor in on this decision. Bitcoin was really ideologically kind of neutered back then. 
And what we're seeing right now is not sufficient for Bitcoin to be a means of exchange. Bitcoin as a means of exchange will exist on L2s, layer 2s, built on top of Bitcoin that enable commerce like CivKit, Civilization Toolkit, a process, a product that I'm leading. Um, it's sad too because when you look at Bitcoin, the very first version of Bitcoin Core that was created by Satoshi Nakamoto himself had marketplace functions in there. 11 opcodes that would just allow Bitcoin to do the same thing that eBay is doing. But Satoshi Nakamoto himself, the guy who created Bitcoin, knew store of value is not enough. The whole point is a means of exchange to enable global commerce. This is why we are here. All right, and definitely we'll keep tracking the future of Bitcoin at this time. But what are you seeing going forward for the exchange business? That's the cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrency exchange business going forward. Uh, the exchange business is coming under increasing pressure from regulators. They want to completely lock it down in every which way possible. You've already seen it in the West. It's going to start growing in the global South. You look at Nigeria. They banned crypto banks from doing business with cryptocurrency exchanges just up until a month ago. Then they came out with a super expensive license to cost half a million dollars or more. But you want to cut the little guys out. It's a game that the little guys are being cut out of. The innovation is being cut out. Regulation is going to continue to increase. And the people that really want to do the things that they want to do with their money are going to turn to other products, more decentralized products. So it's an arms race, basically with continued pressure and suffocating pressure that basically removes any of the real benefit of crypto, the people will adjust and they will turn to more and more decentralized projects, peer-to-peer -peer projects like no one's in CivKit, and they'll continue to be able to find ways to do the things that they need to do to enrich their lives and make themselves more prosperous. So the battle continues, guys, and it's a battle of wills, and at the end of the day, it's actually a spiritual battle. <laughs> Quite interested. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. Uh, Ray Youssef, CEO, um, No One. So it was great having your perspective today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would say I encourage the people not to just blame their governments. It's very for easy for us. You know, I'm Egyptian. I was born in Egypt. It's very easy for the Egyptians just to blame their government and call their governments corrupt. And the Nigerians do the same thing. But these situations are very complex. Our governments are under extreme pressure from forces even they can't control. This is coming from people with guns a lot bigger than them that like to apply pressure by hurting them financially and making everyone in the country poorer all at once. So if we just blame our our leaders, it's the path to impotence. We have to take the time to educate ourselves and understand where this pressure is coming from and realize colonialism never really left Africa. They just well put on a different garb. <laughs> well said. Thank you so much, uh, Yusuf. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, now let's get to some of the uh, top gainers uh, this afternoon. We see, um, yeah, one of those um, meme coins there, topping that counter, $2.33, about 21.59%. And Ton, uh, that's uh, trading at $4.27, um, up 18.24%. So we're seeing double digit gains with most of the top cryptocurrencies at this time. Let's look at the losers counter now. Uh, we see uh, Cash, that's uh, topping the counter. Um, 2.33%, just a single digit loss um, right there, 15 cents. IOTA's uh, at 38 cents, 1.78% um, down. And we have uh, MENA protocol, $1.54. That's down 1.54%, um, quite interesting uh, with the change there. So these are how uh, most of the markets uh, are looking that we track um, right here. And uh, definitely we're looking out for the close. Um, that's for the local boss later today. And I'll be um, giving you a, a wrap up of what played out in that uh, market, uh, that's at 10 p.m. So thank you so much uh, for watching. That's the show today. You can visit channelcv.com for more updates. I'm Laddie Williams from the team right here at Channels HQ. It's bye for now.